Euh, donc, euh, bienvenue à, au séminaire DIC. Euh, on est content d'accueillir le professeur Peter Hancock de, du département de psychologie à l'Université de Floride. Il va nous parler de l'avenir de la machine qui n'aura plus besoin d'être d'un gestion, gestionneur humain. Euh, je vais peut-être passer ça. Il est, il est professeur de psychologie, il dirige... Euh, une recherche, uh, une, un laboratoire de recherche à MIT aussi. It's yours now, Peter. Thank you very much indeed. Um, let me just thank you for inviting me today. 50 minutes is a short time, so I shall be going through uh, fairly quickly, but please feel free to record so that people can, um, uh, can look later. There's lots and lots of things to look at as we're going through. So let's begin. Um, so, uh, I am going to talk today about um, a line of uh, research and development that um, I've been looking at in relation to how humans interact with machines and particularly uh, ever greater levels of intelligence of those machines. And I wrote an article recently that I posted um, uh, for you, it's called um, Machining the Mind to Mind the Machine. And so this is the next step along that line of um, development. Uh, so this presentation is entitled The Machine That Will Soon Need No Minding. And so I think it's very relevant, especially because this is probably one of the last things I shall do not written by chat GBT. So let's see what we're gonna do. Um, there will be pieces of music. They do have a meaning. Um, please feel free again to review later on. So my allocution today will be number one. I shall talk about automation as the thin end of the wedge, already in action. I shall talk a little bit about my own metaphor for the rising isles of autonomy we are seeing grow almost on a daily basis. I'm going to ask the question, who do you trust? And finally, I'm going to look at what times may come. Now, I know when I'm watching someone present, I'm always aware of how long is it that they are going to speak for and how tired am I going to be at the end? So what I've done is I put a little race car here for you, which will tell you where you are now. We've just started, and you can see the finish line over to the right. You'll be able to see that periodically to tell you where we are, so how to calibrate your efforts here. So I'm going to start off by uh, talking about automation, which I've called the thin end of the wedge. There's little doubt that automation plays an enormous role in our lives. It didn't used to, uh, certainly not when I was first um, uh, entered upon the planet, but uh, since then, automation is almost ubiquitous, especially in um, in advanced societies. So I want to start with the definitions, and these, of course, are my own. I don't want to um, I don't want to borrow from others. I just want to acknowledge there are many others. But an automated systems are designed to accomplish a a specific set of largely deterministic steps, um, often with a repeating pattern or sequence, and they are designed to achieve one of a very limited set of predefined goals. Um, uh, entomologically, it comes from the uh, basis of auto, meaning self, and motion, or well, motion, meaning automated systems are in, in some sense self-moving. Uh, that's the uh, nice derivation. But autonomous systems, uh, in contrast a little, are generative. Uh, they lead, uh, evolve, they learn and evolve rather, uh, from feedback and from uh, operational and contextual information that they encounter. And I think uh, it's one of their characteristics, their actions will necessarily become more indeterminate across time. I've written about this, I'll show you the paper. Um, but the foundation interesting of the autonomy is denied again from uh, auto meaning the self and uh, nomos meaning law. So autonomous systems are um, uh, generated as laws unto themselves. I think that's a very good um, uh, definition. But I want to affirm for today, there's no necessarily disruptive threshold between uh, an automated system and an autonomous system. So I don't want to draw them as though they are completely uh, independent. They overlap with each other. An autonomous system can still be automated in parts and vice versa. So let's start off with some nice um, semi-automation here. I've got my cows, here they are is a uh, milking farm in Scotland. And you can see that we've got a nice little bit of automation going on here. The cows seem quite happy. They're 
stand outside ready for their turn. This is a little bit different. This is a completely automated mm -hmm. milking machine. Here the cow enters, they're entertained by a little bit of feed. And lo and behold, the robotic system now um, begins to do its thing. You can see that it's fairly well designed. Uh, the cow comes in, they're occupied, and uh, out comes the milk. The production is done. Notice there's no humans here at the end of milking. Uh, the cow is then uh, brought out and released and the MR-S1, they've always got interesting names like that. But the cow then exits and um, presumably the feed is still there and the Peter, milk is extracted. Peter, Peter, I have to ask you, isn't there much more of this uh, kind of uh, imagery? Because there's quite a strong uh, emotional reaction to this kind of thing here in Quebec. Imagery, sorry? Imagery of the cows suffering. Oh, I, I don't know that they're suffering. I'm just rep I, uh, reporting what happens to them. Um, uh, not my not my choice, as you say, but um, I'll find some that are um, that are a little different. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I understand your point. Um, I'm just uh, going to later in my uh, in my uh, discourse. I'm going to ask questions about those very things. Are we okay? Uh, it depends on how much more of that there is. Uh, there's there's no more of that, although I will refer to um, a reference to it a little bit later on. But, okay, um, no more cows, that's fine. Oh, well, I've, I've got one more, if you'll allow me, and so uh, we'll talk about the transition. But let's look at another example, then, um, uh, along this line of progress of automation. This is um, this is uh, the Pilbara mine, it's in Western Australia, and uh, the tech uh, the technical person, Tim Day, says uh, they should actually uh, introduce a lot more hours onto the machines. Uh, you don't need lunch breaks. You don't need crib times or shift changes. The idea is that you have a mine here that's working completely without human beings. And I just think that that's maybe quite remote from us. Certainly Western Australia is remote. Um, but let's look at something a little bit closer. Here we now have a different sort of automation, but an automation we can all identify with and the way that automation is beginning to affect our own lives and our immediate environment. Uh, this is another step along this line of progress. I brought this up because there's a, a, uh, a argument right now in, um, in uh, uh, England about whether we need um, or don't need uh, a, a train guards, whether there should be one. But here's this gentleman doing his job. He seems to be quite happy doing his job. Um, but many jobs are now automated. So some of uh, people listening here will be able to um, you know, remember elevator operators. Um, we rarely see those anymore. If we do, uh, doorman, hotel doorman used to be common. They're not common anymore. But I think one of the important things is we're not just dissipating a dignified level of work. We are taking away what is called teletic activity. Uh, that's uh, from Chicksett Mahai. Um, uh, flow the, uh, uh, the psychology of optimal experience. But the point to emphasize here that I did back in uh, 1997 is that uh, people actually enjoyed their jobs. So um, uh, are we taking away things that people actually enjoy doing? Now, one of our um, my previous colleagues um, named uh, Earl Wiener, noted that automation in general is what he called dumb and dutiful. So it's dumb in the sense that it will only do what it, uh, it is prescribed to do and dutiful in the sense that it will do exactly that. So it performs as instructed, uh, no matter how stupid, absurd, or even uh, in this case, as Stefan brings up, potentially damaging that the instructions are. And so let's have a, a little look at that. So there's an example of something being pretty dumb and pretty dutiful, but in the end causing harm and damage. So we look at those things and say, well, uh, is that a good thing? Do we want that automation? And so one of my questions today is, do we want those sort of automations? And then by extension, what sort of autonomy it is that we will then begin to look at? And so I'm going to look at those issues um, automation was and potentially still might largely be dumb and dutiful. But I think the empirical question we need to challenge ourselves with today is in the modern world, 
are precisely who is it that's dumb and who is it that's dutiful? Is it the automation or the person? So I'm gonna ask questions about um, machining the mind to mind the machine. And I am extremely worried about the way in which we are creating, in this case, human uh, conditions uh, that are uh, slowly but surely uh, evolving to match um, the workings of the machine. Uh, I've written about this, and again, I'm happy to um, provide copies to anybody uh, who wants it. But this was my extended, um, extended uh, look at that particular problem. And it worries me extremely that there might be a growing imperative towards what I'm beginning to call machination, and that is the requirement to conform uh, as enforced by machine. And so again, today we are looking at the questions of choice, the questions of opportunity, and uh, the questions of how we improve um, what is what I want to call human-centered automation. So uh, about 20 years ago, my colleagues, um, people like Raja Parasurman, Tom Sheridan and others, uh, suggested that automation doesn't replace human performance, it changes human performance. And so what they wanted to say is that automation was augmenting human capacity. And I think in the early stages of transition, that may possibly be true. Uh, but if you build a system where people are rarely required to respond, we know that they will then rarely respond when required. And this is uh, what we call the, the specter of vigilance. And uh, one of my colleagues has referred to this as the humans are becoming the subsystem of last resort. Uh, in, vigilance is a, uh, is a uh, impoverished task for a human being to perform. And so we'll look at that, but I don't wanna distress Stephen too much, but just to ask the question, where is the dignity and the challenge and the joy in such forms of work? I've always been staggered by this particular next video. I hope you don't find it problematic, but um, I just want to show this. Um, it's um, a, a reinforcement uh, experiment. Um, we've seen them before, They're probably pretty old days. But I just want to say, I'm unable to keep up with this chat. I've watched it a hundred times. I know the sequence that's coming up, but under those circumstances, I am still unable to keep up. So. What is the nature of that work? And if that's so, there are agencies and entities that can actually perform that sort of work much better than I can. And we don't need to be giving um, uh, me that sort of work when there's much better capacity to do it elsewhere. Uh, we can talk about the morality of these things at the end. I'm happy to do so. So let's go to New York in about 1900. And if you were standing on the top of a, a ma major um, uh, high rise there. You could spend your time playing spot the car. And in fact, there are cars in that um, uh, line of traffic there. But 1900, you can see that. But uh, the same sort of um, general area in 1913, you now have to play spot the horse. And so what I want to emphasize is that the transition and penetration of new technologies is occurring all the time. And this is a um, this is a uh, map from NASA, and thanks to Mike Cleary for providing it. But what it shows is when you introduce um, new technologies, you do get these transient phases of development. And uh, these are the transient phases of uh, modern aircraft that you can see into the jet age and later on into what we call the electronic or fly-by-wire age. And what we see is transient increases in events as that new technology begins to be enacted. And so some of the questions that we um, could ask is, uh, is there any predictable timetable for these phases of transition when they happen and these phases of transience when they happen? Uh, here's another one. This is a uh, picture in the Ford Motor Company and we can play the game of spot the robot. And I think everybody can do that. And then in the modern world, we can play the, the game of spot the human. And um, we can see that um, in a short period of time, uh, in, in evolutionary terms, we can see a, uh, a, a extraordinary change in the context of work and who is delivering that work. So Stephen, you're gonna have to forgive me. I'm gonna just talk, um, I'm gonna make a quotation, not my quotation, but this is from an English magazine called uh, Private Eye. It says, um, cows either grazing in the fields or housed in large shed decide for themselves. I think that's questionable where they want to be milked and form an orderly queue outside. Some dairy parlors are now milking 24 seven without any human present. Um, 
I found that um, uh, you might want to reference um, this wonderful piece of uh, short story writing by Saki or Hector Hugh, Hugh Munro called The Map in Life. And it might um, uh, then, I think, trigger some ideas in relation to some of the things I'm sure we'll talk about in questions. Uh, his last recorded um, his last recorded utterance was put that light out. He was unfortunately uh, shot in the First World War. So now let's ask another question. Um, maybe this is closer to home. So we've seen our cow examples. What about this one? Students, either grazing in the fields or housing large sheds, decide for themselves when they want to be educated and form an orderly queue outside. Some universities are now instructing 24 seven without any teacher present. Uh, should we autonomize or automate graduate school? Well, when I first suggested this some years ago, it just sounded completely hilarious. It was off the wall. Um, now, since we've had COVID, and since we've had other methods of doing things, including this own presentation today, eh, not so much. Not so much a, a source of um, a source of comedy, I don't think. And so, um, are there things that we should not and should never automate? Should we there milking? I put it as a question. Um, Stephen has brought up some. A moral dimensions of how we treat other members of the biota, perfectly reasonable, and uh, I'll be happy to talk about those. But how about human leisure? Should I send my robot on um, on a holiday for me, on vacation, on vacances? Who knows? Um, family, uh, I've often, when I've uh, talked about this with people, some people say, yeah, we might automate some family, but human relationships, should we automate those? Are there some things that are sacrosanct that we don't want automation uh, to penetrate into? And so some of the questions that I've asked is, uh, surely we have both a moral and a pragmatic duty uh, to consider purpose. That is, what is it we are trying to achieve over process? That is, how is it achieved? And uh, one of my conclusions will be that we are uh, thrusting forward with process and not considering purpose. But I discussed this in a uh, 2014 paper, hard to believe it was written a decade ago, but I'm asking the simple empirical question there, automation, how much is too much? Um, there seems to be no end to uh, uh, lines of development and little way of control. Um, just to let you know where we are, a little car is moving along here, and you can see we have made some ground, and I'm going to talk about uh, what are aisles of autonomy? I um, just wanted to show you um, the vestiges of um, the vestiges of technology when they depart. This is um, this was the uh, world's busiest telegraph office. It was in New Delhi. Uh, it was in the height of um, uh, the height of technology at the time, but the technology has now moved on and disappeared, and we don't even have a computer in that room. Uh, but that was um, at one juncture that would have been considered the height of technology, and interestingly, it's within my lifespan. So it's within living memory. So our current track is not really asking about how we automate. Um, I think we've already begun to pass that watershed, that transition phase. And I think the next one we are facing is, should we autonomize? Should we allow uh, all autonomous systems uh, to begin to uh, proliferate in the same way that automation passed us without their app? Uh, I think no domain is currently more uh, prominent in this research than ground transportation. Uh, and I've argued that it's the modal or something called the wedge issue. But I want to say um, that natural language processing, uh, watch the developments this week. And so all of a sudden, uh, ground transportation, uh, driverless cars has become a little bit passe um, because of um, the developments in uh, large scale natural language processing which now regale our screens. So it shows you how fast these things turn over. Just to give you a little bit more background on, um, on uh, the idea of, um, of uh, driverless vehicles, um, the SAE, uh, derived from a scale I'll talk about, came up with these five levels from no automation uh, to full automation. I think as psychologists in general, we would realize that zero is not good. So. When you say, oh, it's a zero, no automation, that seems to be bad. And if it's a one to five scale or zero to five scale, full automation must be good. And so you can see in the engineer's mind, everything is tending down. So we want to go from zero uh, to five. 
Essentially, it's an engineering roadmap for progress. There is no question in there that's asked about whether we should do it or whether morally we're justified in doing it. It's just, can we achieve that? And so it's a computer science and an engineering challenge, which people in computer science and engineering embrace immediately and uh, find it very motivating and stimulating. Uh, this is where it actually came from. This is, um, this is the 10 levels um, uh, by uh, Tom Sheridan, but you can see that uh, they got crunched down to five levels uh, for, for wider public uh, uh, consumption. And here is uh, the Venerable Professor Sheridan with myself, and we are uh, just uh, uh, got out of the Google self-driving car. So um, uh, this was now some years ago. Uh, uh, you can see I look a little older even now. So again, what we're beginning to see is we're beginning to see roadmaps that are supposed progress, but we're not asking the questions about whether we should, only whether we can. Um, there's a little reference here. I think we're not just eliminating the teletic activity I talked about before, but we're actually promising to eradicate vast swathes of human work. Uh, will truck drivers and taxi drivers go the way of Gandhi dancers. I'll answer questions about what a Gandhi dancer is. A hundred years ago, I wouldn't have to. In 20 years time, I might very well have to ask a question of what is a taxi driver. And so you can see that on an evolutionary scale, we are changing almost um, in the blink of an eye. So again, um, looking at the state that we are, the small issue navigating the evolution from automation to autonomy. I think you'll understand that I said that the two are not mutually exclusive, but we're beginning to look at that. And what limits do we then set on autonomy? That's one of the questions. And precisely where, when, and then how do we then agree to set such limits? I've not personally been asked to do that. Uh, so I have written again on this, imposing limits on autonomous systems and we should have done that, and we should be doing it uh, now. So this is the metaphor I want you to um, to embrace, if you will. This is my metaphor. There are others. Uh, but um, here I'm beginning to look at what I would call the Isles of Autonomy as a series of phase transitions. So you can see the idea of the sea level as a, a ratio of human to autonomous capacities. And there, poking up to begin with, we have First, a singular island of autonomy, uh, which is surrounded by, in this case, a swathe of human supporters. Um, you can see them as the beach there, the yellow in the uh, top uh, left illustration. The autonomy is the growing green circle. I called it a literal or a littoral collaboration. But this comes under there as something called artificial narrow intelligence, or ANI. You can see this is a single growing entity, uh, but it's basically limited and it's surrounded by a lot of supporting um, human individuals to make it work. Uh, the next stage, of course, is as the relative sea level begins to fall, I think the critical watershed we are starting to begin to see now is when discrete autonomous systems begin to link together. Uh, I think it's very interesting that the isthmus between the two is gonna be first composed by humans. So I wanted to show you an illustration of this. Um, in this case, it's from a German engineering um, uh, a notion, uh, but the phase we're in now is called the the, for the procession from fool to teammate. Not sure I like either of those, but let's have a look at an example. You really have a lot of things in common with Jack. Jack also has to uh, make himself being a real participant of his specific environment. Here. Jack does that pretty well. I'm observing the way he's taking us along the highway entirely autonomously and safely while we can have a conversation in peace. What Jack gives us is kind of personal freedom. In fact, I'd be interested to know how Jack manages to carry out maneuvers safely at this speed. For example, how does Jack know when he can overtake? So there's an example in which you have two uh, entities that are relatively um, uh, independent, but now they take a human being uh, to provide the bridge between them. Uh, for how much longer, uh, I really can't say, but I think the acceleration rate will begin to um, begin to stagger us uh, all. So I want to just complete the picture of the Isles of Autonomy because slowly autonomous systems will begin to dominate uh, the ecosphere. 
and humans will potentially uh, then be sequentially squeezed out. Uh, some of my more um, optimistic colleagues, uh, I'm thinking particularly of Ben Schneiderman, uh, see a sort of endless vista of um, improved opportunity and work. I'm afraid I don't because of the number of human beings and the way in which um, the way in which uh, we are organized. And eventually, we might be looking at remaining aisles of humanity. Um, and I am uh, particularly um, concerned with that line of progress. But if you look at the line of progress, you can see the metaphor develops in that manner. So beware. We must beware. This is my warning. It's an allocution, so I want to be beware. Once we autonomize, there is no going back. We can't suddenly decide not to at some uh, later juncture down the road. Um, this is evident from even a cursory perusal of um, uh, historical events. I'm a student of uh, English history, so I can refer to Kett's Rebellion uh, that concerned uh, enclosure, uh, the Luddite movement uh, concerning, in this case, um, uh, uh, artificial production. And there's another example I brought up, which is Sarah Island uh, in uh, Australia. I'm uh, happy to talk further about those. But the step forward is not one that we can regress uh, except at uh, particularly problematic circumstances. Again, we can talk a little bit about that in questions, I hope. So let's uh, have a little um, uh, survey of what we've got. Um, what happens when autonomy strikes? Um, so each separate isle of autonomy will become a, a, a law unto itself. And then aggregated autonomies necessarily create nonlinearities. I think it's a necessary uh, characteristic of their of their confluence and nonlinear uh, developments. What that means is that our task becomes to navigate these emerging spaces, but we really don't know how to do that right now. And we are in a phase of transition, which means it's unstable anyway. Um, I just want to make this general statement that emergent properties need bear no functional resemblance to their constituent elements. I think we've known that for a while, certainly since a, a nice paper in science in 1964, I believe. But that will leave us being constantly in a state of surprise about what it's doing. And I believe, therefore, behooves us we must now set the functional constraints to these systems, but we simply aren't. Um, no, one's, um, no one's talking to uh, Tesla. Let me go back to um, a famous English, uh, famous English TV program, The Prisoner. Let's have a look how they forecast this. Good morning. I bought you the activities prognosis you ordered. Uh, good. How, how accurate are these? Uh, what is the percentage of right and wrong? I'm afraid we don't know that. Why not? Oh, twice we programmed our machines for a percental appraisal of their own efficiencies. Each time they refused to give back the requested information. Refused? How? Simply by not returning the data to us. They'll be wanting their old trade union next. To... So we are not the first to uh, look at these um, particular issues. But the issue that is coming up, so the, the challenge is, I believe right now, the proximal challenge in the next two or three years is avoiding adversity. So I've, again, uh, written something on that that's been published just this last year, uh, which has a series of commentaries on it. Um, and when and where emergence will strike, we don't know. And precisely what we'll be able to do about it, we certainly don't know. I've seen lots of proposals as to what we might do, but I've never seen anything that's particularly um, particularly clear about uh, retrenching. Um, the thing that I focus on probably more in my own mind, in my own thinking, is um, the issue of time. And this is my concern. We always should be aware of the impact of time, but we have a sort of um, privileged position with respect to time. Human beings believe time ought to flow at the rate that, um, uh, that they find phenomenologically comforting. Um, but let's consider a little bit of history here. Um, let's go back to the uh, the age-turning battle of the Toysburg Forest that uh, uh, number nine in the common era, um, Augustus Caesar was not happy. Uh, uh, so nine in the common era is approximately uh, 1.27 times 10 to the power of 12 of human perceptual moments. I'm taking a human perceptual moment from um, uh, William James, approximately 50 milliseconds, but we find at current computing levels, that's just half a computational moment ago. What this means is that computer time or technology time or autonomy time need bear no resemblance to human time. 
So on a human time, when is trust in the autonomy effectively to be expressed? Uh, if that's the case, that's really talking about um, uh, 25 milliseconds in which for us to make a decision which human beings just can't do. And I call this issue uh, the temporal uh, dissonance issue that I've raised myself repeatedly. Um, and with such distance, uh, there may be no time to act. We assume, we make an assumption, and it's an invalid assumption, that there will always be time to go forward and make corrective changes. I think if the temporal disparity grows to such an extent, I think we'll begin to see that we don't even have opportunity to do that. So the human time scale of operations is an assumption, but not a given reality. So now let's have imagine that if you can, uh, looking at um, uh, teams, in this case, who have wide temporal desynchronicity. Let's suppose we have a cheetah and a sloth. What can we imagine if we have cheetah sloth hunting teams? How do those tend to work together? So does artificial narrow intelligence and artificial general intelligence, of the problem of transparency, does transparency have any meaning beyond a certain critical time disparity? In essence, can the sloth talk meaningfully to the cheetah? And the answer is probably not. So let us ask ourselves the critical question, are there any truly autonomous technological systems? Do they exist? Until about recently, I think 2020 and the start of COVID, I would have personally said no, at least not fully self-intentioned ones. I'm still unsure. But today I want to sort of revisit that opinion. And particularly, I want to see it uh, revisit the opinion in terms of the experimental work I do, which is the work on trust. So let's now go and look at our next stage, uh, which is who and how we trust. Notice our car is making some ground, we are moving forward. So um, trust can be defined in a number of ways. I use this common one by um, uh, Lee and C. Uh, the attitude that an agent will help achieve an individual's goals in a situation characterized by uncertainty and vulnerability. Of course, I like um, uh, my own definition with uh, 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 Deb Billings and Kristin Schaefer, uh, the reliance uh, by any agent that actions prejudicial to their well-being will not be undertaken by influential others. And of course, what you can then see when you look at that um, those set of definitions is you can begin to plot out a, a trust level versus a risk level. So uh, quite typically in high risk level situations, people are loath to trust and vice versa. Uh, there are phases of overtrust, under trust, and then people are either risk averse or risk loving. We can plot those out. So um, again, I just want to point out that this is redolent of our literature. Um, these are nice 1950s uh, science fiction covers from Robert Hoffman. They uh, uh, certainly uh, look at the um, look at the robots. We actually created the middle one for our for our paper. Uh, and uh, what factors is, is our trust predicated on? So I've done probably 10 or 15 years looking at trust. So just a quick overview of some of the basic contents of trust, uh, because we are going to be asked to trust systems that we have very little information about. Uh, first of all, trust is dynamic. There is a antecedent, a momentary effect, and a sequential effect. You can see that actually in um, uh, the order of um, chapters that are dealt with in uh, William James's original psychology book. Um, it's a cybernetic process because there's feedback. If uh, you do something that's prejudicial to me, um, I will subsequently adjust my trust. If you are reliable, I will trust you more. And then there are at least two entities, a trustee and a trustor, and they must have some sort of communication channel between them. So that's the minimals of trust. Um, we developed for um, various um, agencies a, a trust model around 2011. Um, we looked at, um, in this case, we were asked to look at robot um, trust. We looked at human-related factors, robot-related factors, and environmental factors. And we identified a variety of those. I only want to point out that um, the most important one in 2011 by far was the reliability of the robot. Did it do exactly what it said it was going to do? Did it work as advertised? Um, Ten years later, we uh, looked at um, a meta-analysis of the same, um, uh, the same literature, but with another decade to add. And again, we find the three basic areas, human, robot, and, and contextual trust. But now we can divide them a little more, um, a little more uh, uh, into detail. 
And that gives us a variety of um, factors that we can identify. And I'm um, happy to send you the paper, but it gives you all of the factors where they are correlational, where they're causal, and um, whether they affect individual differences. And we can do this for each one and begin to identify what factors it is will uh, influence somebody's willingness to trust. And we just finished a very large um, uh, 4,000 effect size uh, meta-analysis on why humans trust humans as opposed to any other form of technology. So let's move along. Trust will be a critical dimension as to how these systems are used, probably not as to how they are innovated. And moving quickly, moving towards some conclusion. So um, let us now look at things that are a little less esoteric and little things that we will encounter every day. Uh, this call is recorded for quality purposes. Um, we all bump into that one. I hope we do. I, I bump into it almost every time I pick a phone up nowadays. And uh, you can ask the next question. Well, is it? Uh, then why do I get the same awful service time after time? So I begin to suspect that there are some issues here. How about this one? How are you doing today? Uh, a disembodied voice asks me. I'm always intrigued. So why many spots are so concerned with my personal health? It's just an opening gambit, of course. Our menu has changed. Please listen to the following options. Well, what they really mean, the menu hasn't changed, but we're downloading our troubleshooting issues to the user here. So these responses are not necessarily autonomous per se, but they are automation designed in this case to maximize profit in some fashion. So imagine now what autonomy will do to those common everyday sort of gambits that we all encounter. And in this sense, I'm uh, very much uh, a fan of Goethe because as autonomy begins to strive for control, I think we can look and see if machine autonomy is waxing at the expense of human autonomy waning. And of course, Goethe, um, Wonderful, uh, wonderful thinker uh, uh, wrote originally, you must be hammer or anvil. Uh, specifically, he said, you must either conquer or rule or serve and lose, suffer or triumph. Um, and there's also Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. In, in this world, man must be either anvil or the hammer. Um, are we humans turning from hammer into anvil? Um, or in another sense, are we morphing from that which is the user to that which is the used? Um, here is an issue, again, that I have uh, tried to wrestle with uh, quite often. It's a conundrum because local optimization, that is optimization within local constraints, begins to lead to global dysfunctionality. So as everything strives for its own local optimization, uh, the global effect is um, pernicious and it is uh, problematic. And I think we see this in more than the autonomy world. We see this in the world we occupy. Uh, so, um, currently, how much individual autonomy do you actually possess? Uh, I am possessing more and more. My university tells me I have to fill in more and more forms. I don't have autonomy to say no. I don't want to have to fill in this form. How much individual autonomy do we think we possess? Uh, I think it's worthwhile to consider the question carefully and most especially truthfully. I think we possess much less autonomy as individuals than we would like to believe. So just have a look at this, for example. It pops up on my screen every so often. Uh, you have to click to continue. There's no choice here. Required, required, okay? When a website requires these fields, it is very much more likely to be profit-centered than human-centered. It's not concerned with you as an individual. It's concerned with you as a used item. Um, when is our power here to say no? It's limited at best. You can... Uh, abjure from their service if you so desire, but often their service is something you actually have to have, and so you can't abjure if you desire. So to say no is sometimes to express distrust, uh, but you're often leveraged into saying yes. And so um, in respect to autonomy and trust, we can ask um, questions about whether trust is an important issue in the future, if you can leverage people and they have to be there. You either use the product or you are the product, or as I said, either technology works for you or you work for technology. I think it's worth asking you the question of whether you think where you are on there. Uh, websites collect such data as human beings are now becoming the commodity itself. It's an interesting flip. Um, I think the social network had a good take on that. 
you can look at it in epithets such as cash for eyeballs, uh, cash for clicks, fees of attention, or the uh, recent scare that chat GBT will take over all of journalism. Um, such systems tend to optimize on goals, but they're not conscious, I don't think, in any sense that we understand uh, what's human conscious. Um, but we have previously been warned of all this eventuality. This is not new to human beings. Nihil sub sole novum, there is nothing new under the sun. So let's have a look at what uh, Henry David Thoreau said. Uh, he said, the low we've been from tools of our tools in 1854, uh, well over a century and a half ago. Uh, this is Samuel Butler in Erewhon, may not machine man himself become a sort of parasite upon the machine, an affectionate machine tickling aphid. Uh, that was possible, we saw earlier, 1872, and my favorite probably is um, uh, Sandberg. Um, I have seen the old gods go and the new gods come. Day by day and year by year, the idols fall and the idols rise. Today I worship the hammer. It must be hammer or anvil. I was in Sandberg, collected poetry in 1914. So if autonomy neuters uh, the effects of distrust, do we create some sort of societal state of rational paranoia? Uh, that is, I'm not allowed to distrust something because I'm not allowed to disagree with it. Um, uh, I think that uh, it is true, as I've said, the assiduous paranoid eventually finds their conspiracy, but I don't think there's a conspiracy per se right now. It's just that there are no monolithic goals in effect. So rather, it is different and largely just unstructured and distributed local uh, optimization algorithms that they presently um, compete, uh, albeit indirectly, to achieve some sort of uh, parochial goal. It's artificial natural intelligence, but we're moving towards this. The future is not a deterministic necessity, nor obliged to be a linear extrapolation of those past conditions, and as will be encapsulated in artificial general intelligence. And then what makes it problem and pernicious is that the traveling window of what I call generational ignorance means that we're all adapting to a new norm. I teach students, some of whom are 17 and 18 years old, and they consider uh, the attack of 911, they consider it something for the history books. And pretty soon we will now have children in kindergarten who consider the idea of the pandemic as a historical event because the window moves along and our new normal is constantly being adjusted. So then I want to conclude today and give plenty of chances for, um, for questions. Um, I could advance opaque automation already be autonomous. Um, yes, at least to some degree, and probably that is a growing degree. Um, I think we've seen these sort of um, uh, interruptions that we see with discussions about natural language processing. I also saw some emergent properties derived from large scale models of, uh, I think, the visual system, which seemed to um, generate an emergence of number, which was absolutely fascinating. Um, but we begin to see some echoes of these things, uh, but we don't necessarily recognize it when we actually see it. So large scale software systems already optimize upon multiple goals. They don't optimize on a single goal anymore. They're not single cybernetic automated feedback systems. They are much more complicated and elaborative than that. And this makes uh, unequivocal understanding of their aims exceedingly difficult, especially if they're adapting and adapting at the speed that I talked about. And how do we calibrate our trust in such opaque systems? Well, right now I would suggest they're calibrated poorly and often irrationally. We based upon surface features, not what the system is actually doing, but just the things that might appear in a display. And in a profit-driven obligatory use system, uh, is trust of any inevitable long-term concern? That is, if you have to use this system, you have no choice. And if it is using you as the element of um, the product, and not in this case a human-centered one, do you have any um, uh, choice in the, in the system? And I'm suggesting only limited way right now and a diminishing way, and that is why it's an allocution. So are we in fact choosing the wrong road? Um, hope people get the metaphor. Um, and when did you personally, as people listening to me today and myself, when did you make that choice? When did someone say to you, this is what we, as a human society will uh, uh, choose to do. So um, I thank you for listening to me. I managed to get in with two or three minutes there. Um, I uh, have a few books that you might be interested in and I'm happy to send any papers. Uh, I do like um, 
for five days uh, epitaph, which uh, actually moved inside Western Strabi, life suggesting all things know it, I thought so once, now I know it. And I'm coming to believe that um, Paradoia is much more um, much more ubiquitous than you like to believe. But with that, I will ask if you have any questions. Our little car is reaching its end, crossing the end over there. And um, we have now done. So thank you very much. I will go to black screen. I will then stop sharing. And I'll be happy to take any questions that um, uh, folks may have. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, we have, um, can somebody get the door? Um, we have um, about 40 minutes for questions. Sure, not a problem. We, Usually it's uh, it starts sluggishly, sometimes it doesn't get off the ground at all. But I'd like to ask anyone here in the room or in the if they have any questions. I have a question. Go ahead. Speak very loud. How can how well can you hear, Peter? Uh, I can hear a little better than when we were uh, previewing. But if people can speak up, that'd be great. If they can tell me who they are and a little bit about them, that will help me as well. Okay, very loud. Hi, my name is Nuha. I'm doing a PhD here at UCAM. Um, I have a question regarding a sentence that you've written earlier in your slides. You said the future is not a necessity for it to be a linear extrapolation of the past. While to some degree that's correct, I do think that accumulation in general in science is what makes um, things advanced so for example we wouldn't have you know uh, neural systems if we didn't have uh, natural language processing we wouldn't have engineering if we didn't have someone you know that accumulated some knowledge in the past um so i think yeah. trying to have this theory of thinking of saying you know we don't want to depend on the past we don't need humans anymore we do need humans to give us uh, experience about how to use the systems that are so smart today and that applies to across the board to everything so yeah, uh, taxi you're, drivers you're, you're... are yeah, your, your point's well taken. So let's um, set it in a different context and then bring up here. So I just finished a um, an article, um, which I can't let anybody have because it's just um, been submitted. It's called, Are Humans Still Necessary? So uh, one of the sentences I wrote in there uh, is that um, the answer to, are humans still necessary, is that humans will always be necessary to themselves. But let me let me take your, um, your, your point. Um, so the, the general point is the degree to which the past is um, predicative of the future. Uh, a very good question, um, and I can answer on several levels, but let me answer on the, the Darwinian level. So uh, there's a controversy in, um, in um, uh, biology concerning the, uh, what's called the graduation theory of evolution. That is that um, things sort of evolve in a gradual sense and then there's a second one, which is the sort of punctate equilibrium idea of saltations that occur, and then things stay relatively stable unless there's a large scale external event or there's a large scale um, uh, a, a sort of um, mass extinctions, for example, of which I think we're into number six or something. So uh, yes, your answer is right. Um, uh, we will right now, uh, always um, need humans, especially for ourselves. Uh, I wouldn't want to abandon me. Uh, I find myself necessary to myself. The real thing I'm trying to bring up there is that with the sorts of technology that we are uh, that we are beginning to embrace, there is no necessary um, reason to believe that we won't encounter one of those saltations, one of those uh, situations where whereby um, uh, we we get a uh, a distinct phase transition. Now, um, it's interesting that um, uh, there's a, a Chinese curse that says, may you live in interesting times. And I realized a few years ago, we always live in interesting times. Because of that window of ignorance, we're always interested in our own times. And we all tend to focus on the changes. So um, I think there's a, uh, a, a, a thermal answer to your question I won't go into. But to a degree, yesterday is like today, and it's not like today. And our problem for prognostication is trying to find where and when those um, particular sudden uh, leaps or saltations are taking place. I think my thesis today is that there are um, there are 
potentialities for that happening happening soon and very quickly and much more quickly than we would like. Um, uh, I do appreciate, however, that you are arguing Professor Schneiderman's corner, which is humans will always be necessary. Um, but again, I find a lot of um, species, I would imagine, always thought they were necessary right up to the point they weren't. So um, just a note of caution, I think. But it's a good question, and it's not one that uh, has a deterministic answer, I'm sure. Got it. Thank you so much. Not at all. Vous voulez pas poser des questions? And maybe one question. Good morning. My name is Jalal, uh, as well, a PhD student. I think that you said that uh, aggregating autonomy creates nonlinearity. What do you mean by nonlinearity? Do you mean that it becomes unpredictable? Uh, uh, both of those things, they're not additive. So if you add one uh, autonomous system to another, um, let's supposing I was able to add those two examples that I have, the um, uh, the autonomous robot there uh, directly linked into the autonomous vehicle, um, the uh, additive would be that uh, the two of them would proceed and uh, continue to function rather like a, um, a regular vehicle. But uh, what tends to happen is that um, uh, the number of uh, degree freedom of, uh, degrees of freedom that are available from a concatenation of the two tend to lead to um, uh, nonlinear effects. In the same way that I answered your colleague there, um, the real question is whether those are predictable uh, uh, on both a spatial and a temporal scale. So can we predict when the nonlinearity will emerge? Would we actually recognize it when it did emerge? And in what spatial form would it take? And again, would we recognize it if it took that spatial form? So I think um, uh, there's a nice uh, article by a chap in Science, um, I think it's 1964, I think it might be Anderson, and I think it's called uh, More Than the Sum of the Parts, but I'll be happy to send you that. I just cited it in my, um, in my article. So uh, I just happened to have reread that um, uh, from a while ago. So yes, and the problem is that um, uh, two plus two equaling four is much more predictable for human beings than two plus two equaling five because we don't know where the other one comes from. So that's what I mean by the um, uh, nonlinearity and its uh, expansion. Thank you. Other questions? Otherwise, I'm always here. Uh, people can uh, tell me a little bit more about what they're doing when they're asking questions. That, that would be fascinating. I, I hear uh, two folks doing a PhD. Um, I'd be really interested in what they're doing a PhD in and um, whether this is uh, of interest to them or whether this is peripheral to, um, to the main part of the program. It'd be a good idea if you answer to that, what, what your thesis is. I, I mainly worked, I'm on uh, maternity leave now when it comes to work, but I worked in RPA, so robotic process automation. So I'm very familiar with all the concepts that you've introduced today. Um, now, obviously, while we automate a lot of systems and we do remove a lot of employees, which always causes problems, so even human connections are affected by these types of technologies. And although, yes, we are necessary to ourselves, but we are necessary to each other as well. When you start off with a team that's about 200 people, there are families that are depending on that income. And you come in, you automate the system, and then all of a sudden you only need 50 people. But then you also need 50 other engineers to back up the system, to keep the system going. So the skills are different today. I think people that are not used to technology eventually will be dismissed or they'll have to rely on some sort of government income. And people that have the skills that can operate those machines and do understand the machines are the ones that are going to have jobs, that are going to have jobs in the next few years. So PhD, we're all doing here is uh, cognitive informatics, I think, if you want to translate it. So it's a little bit of AI, I guess, mixed with psychology and other things. Um, so, so yeah, let me let me just elaborate on that then. So uh, the, the work I did was something called the Robotics Collaborative Technology Alliance. And I think part of your uh, your uh, observations there were um, uh, the people who will be looked after by the government. So here's here's my here's my um, uh, axis of argument that I have, especially with with Ben Schneiderman, is that the uh, the replacement is uh, we tend to talk to ourselves. So. 
academics tend to talk to academics. We invite academics. Um, and we tend to believe in the sort of um, uh, the ever expansion and ever increasing capacity to do more and more fascinating uh, uh, work, uh, particularly research work. Um, I, I spend a lot of time standing in malls or sitting in malls. Most people are not like that. Um, when I have an argument with uh, the good Professor Schneiderman, I, I'm not really arguing about um, uh, about the, the sort of uh, high level robotic maintenance that you're talking about. I certainly appreciate it. I think in the current environment, your assessment is probably right. I'm talking about truck drivers, for example. Now, uh, we've been having a shortage of truck drivers recently. Now, I can assure you that there are automated trucks on the road in Florida uh, because Canada is going to be a little different from the United States uh, in terms of how it approaches um, the, uh, the approval of those things. But we do have, uh, in this case, uh, automated trucks. They drive mostly on the uh, something called the turnpike, which is highly predictable. But no one's been asked about that. And so no one asked about the, um, uh, about the truck driver who loses their job. Now, when I talk with engineers, for example, many of them will say, well, those people will go and do something else. And I keep asking them, well, what else have we got from mass employment? And some of the problems in, um, uh, that I see, we, we have a lot of service industry people, but a lot of those service industry elements are readily, absolutely readily replaceable and are being replaced. So I can think of elaborative jobs for NASA scientists. I can think of elaborative jobs even for old psychology professors. But for people who are lumped out of their work, um, uh, the answer that they can do something else is slowly beginning, in my view, to evaporate. So I certainly agree. But um, if you looked at the um, at the sixty minutes, I don't know if you get sixty minutes. The um, uh, the robotic um, the robotic uh, group from uh, London um, again are making amazing strides with uh, robotic capacities that. 10 or 15 years ago would have been thought uh, almost unachievable. And so uh, again, the, 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 the window is narrowing in, in my view. Now, uh, I think you can read Dr. Schneiderman for the optimistic view, uh, but I, I'm looking at the mass of humanity, not the, um, uh, not the people that I usually spend my time talking with. I, I agree with you, but I think you're also, you're viewing this from a Western standpoint. So when you come from the US, the UK, Canada, all these countries, yes, they do live in 2023, but I come from Morocco and I can tell you robotics are nowhere to be found. So Africa is at least a hundred years far off. So whatever the West doesn't want to use anymore, Africa is going to use now. So whatever machinery is too old, Africa is going to be using right now whatever teaching methods are not relevant today. For example, you know, having to come to class instead of doing a Zoom meeting, you know, Internet is super slow when you go into some parts of Africa. You cannot afford those things, uh, although it has a lot of resources, etc. So I do think, yes, yeah, since to some degree, those jobs are going to be somewhat eradicated at some point. But talking of which the uh, automated trucks, for example, they're. They still need the expertise of the truck driver to tell them about the routes and to tell, you know, you have weather conditions that might affect them. It might not be the case in Florida, but the U.S. is not Florida, right? There are other states where there are harsh winters, there are very hot summers, the road have potholes. All those things have to be taken into consideration. So by the time we get into a truly autonomous truck without needing the expertise of a truck driver or someone that knows how to deal with roads, that's going to take some time. Is it going to happen at some point? Yes, but we might probably won't be alive by then, I think. Yeah, um, we're, we're guessing about the, 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 how long it takes. Um, that's why I use the word palimpsest to be, uh, to be very accurate. Um, the palimpsest means that uh, there is no equality of, um, of uh, 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 progress or e equality of uh, implementation, for example, spatially across the globe. You're certainly right in those sense that um, different, um, different locations will uh, embrace and have access to these things accordingly. But again, we have to factor in sort of economies of scale uh, and how um, and how quickly um, those um, societies have changed um, uh, themselves. Uh, I would imagine that I, if I went to uh, Africa, I would still find a whole heck of a lot of cell phones that I wouldn't have found um, uh, maybe a hundred years ago. So my um, my view on time tends to be uh, uh, down the sort of long line of the telescope 
Uh, I don't consider 50 or even 100 years to be a particularly long period of time. Um, I consider them relatively uh, short intervals. So uh, agree, um, but um, uh, certainly uh, about implementation and penetration, certainly agree with that. But um, the way in which we uh, create a global society is um, and now means that things penetrate much more quickly and, and much more pervasively. Thank you. Did you want to describe your thesis? Sure. So I'm working in the finance industry, and uh, I'm interested in FPNA process. So FPNA stands for uh, financial planning and analysis. And basically, this is a discipline where uh, experts do a lot of uh, judgments call. And I'm interested in uh, how to modelize and automate those uh, calls. So this is basically what I'm working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's again, um, I, I don't know, um, I, like our colleague expressed a little earlier, um, there's a degree to which um, yesterday's market predicates today's prices and uh, a degree to which it doesn't. So our prediction is, um, is, is all about trying to capture the multiplicity of factors that go into there. And I think that's, um, uh, that's a hard, um, that's a hard uh, uh, furrow to plow. Um, I'd be interested to see how you're trying to pick those things off. One of the interesting things is that the Oxford study that um, rank ordered, um, that rank ordered uh, the way in which human uh, professions would sort of be uh, extirpated or would disappear. Uh, I think they had things like travel agent close to the top, but one of them were insurance adjuster and um, quantity surveyor, things that um, uh, can fairly easily be taken over. Financial planning is rather interesting because I think it's a highly complex target that you're aiming for. So again, going back to what our colleagues said earlier, it seems that there are places for human beings. I'm just wondering whether the problem is that the that the aisles of humanity are beginning to um, beginning to uh, uh, to dissolve and to uh, to dry up. And um, I uh, I'm happy to uh, accept your um, your uh, current correction about where we are with uh, financial planning per se. Uh, but again, I think the general principle or the general uh, admonition holds, but um, yeah, it sounds a fascinating era. Um, if you're successful, of course, you will have both a Nobel Prize and a billion dollars. Um, so uh, good luck on that. Remember the four <laughs> professors when you get one. <laughs> okay, is there anyone else here? or out there who wants to describe what their own research is in the light of this talk. I warn you, if you don't do it, I'm gonna talk. <laughs> Why is that a warning? <laughs> and some of you can anticipate what I'm going to say. <clears throat> oh, I can anticipate what that is. Stephen, you're, you're um, because I've read your website and I understand and uh, respect your crusade, um, I um, I think I've got a good idea, but carry on, sir. Okay. Um, I I don't know if you use the uh, dairy farming uh, machinery as a metaphor. You could have, but I'm not sure from what you said whether it would count for you as a metaphor. But it is in fact showing just exactly what our mechanized world can do to sentient creatures, of which humans are not the only ones. It, it was it wasn't happenstance, Professor. I did read your um, website. I did um, look at uh, your interests, and uh, so I do want to um, do some things that um, that provoke. Um, I would be interested in your take on that um, because um, if it's a hierarchy, then uh, maybe we're looking at not being on top of the hierarchy anymore. But yeah, please elaborate. I'd be I'd be more than interested. I think factory farming is probably the best example of the monstrosity that technology and automation can do to sentient creatures and that's all it needs to be uh, it's when you showed the uh, the illustration of the child of the, the uh, puppet illustration of the child's head being bashed in by the robot that affected those of us who are who are sort of human centered uh, most strongly but uh, but it's never been just humans they can do it. We can do it to humans, and we can do it to 
cows and we can do it to pigs and we can do it to fish and we can do it to all sorts of other things that we don't need to do it to. And that's the essence of it. We're doing things with automation that are necessary sometimes lots of things that are not necessary and you gave the bottom line you said that when when people say uh this may be recorded it's not for us it's for it's it's and it's not for the machine it's for the real interests that are behind that mm -hmm. yeah well so, one 100 percent agree that there are social political and commercial interests that are very much invested in this uh one of my students uh recommended a book um that uh, I, I can't say, I can't give a spoiler alert because I'm only about five or 10 chapters in there, but it's translated from the Spanish and it's called Tender is the Flesh. So um, I know I can't give a spoiler alert because I, I haven't got through more than a quarter of the book yet, but it is um, very provocative. And um, I think you would uh, enjoy it in that sense. Uh, I won't even describe what it's about, but uh, I think we, uh, we probably both have a similar level of agreement that um, uh, that that some of these uh, some of these large swathes or rivers of um, of development, especially in relation to humans and technology, are almost completely mindless. They occur as epiphenomena, not as not as carefully thought out ideas as to what um, human beings can and should do as um, as caretakers of the planet pro tem. Um, I've asked, I've often discussed the idea whether not only are human beings necessary, but are human beings advisable? And so in the same sense, um, we have to turn the, um, the mirror of history upon ourselves and ask um, whether in fact it is us that, um, that are um, uh, the odd and destructive species. And I've often thought that um, looking at the, um, uh, the structure of the brain that it's, um, certainly insufficiently integrated. And it's, um, I've compared the frontal cortex to a, uh, a, in an evolutionary terms to a tumor, um, its rate of growth across um, uh, relatively few years in evolutionary time is quite staggering. And uh, it is the thing that sort of divides us from uh, most of the other of sentient beings. But um, yeah, I, uh, I particularly wanted to uh, make sure that there was something in there for most people, but especially yourself. I would have been happy if I didn't have to see those cows, I have to say. Uh, well, well, I think one of the great problems, um, again, uh, I've, I've written on a, a thing that I did for my 2021 HFES presidential um, uh, uh, speech, which, I, which has now just come out in Human Factors, is that we would all prefer not to see these things. Um, and so what I've suggested is in relation to things like some of what I've called the existential problems, the um, the global warming, the, um, the maldistribution of water, the uh, erosion of topsoil, is that we need a direct experience of those things. I think a lot more people would change their view and opinion if they were exposed to it. These things are, are held um, in camera, as it were. Uh, factory farming is not something, I would imagine, I'm not gonna say it with, um, with uh, complete unequivocality, but I would imagine a lot of factory farms have um, have uh, guardians, um, people who are security people around there, so that people don't get in to see those conditions. I think you don't, uh, we, you don't have to imagine it; it's, it's true. Yes, I'm sure. And it's yeah. called ag gag. Ag, ag gag, yeah, yeah. And I, I'm sure that many people, many more people, would um, would agree with the, the sentiments um, uh, of change if they were able to do these things directly. But they're not, and they are, as you rightly point out, intentionally hidden for um, from, uh, often for commercial purposes, if nothing else. So yes, we are we are the odd species. We are tearing up the planet. Um, the the work I did on um, understanding the impact on the on the the ocean floor by dragnet um, uh, dragnet fishing is just is just staggering. People people can't even comprehend. The rate of destruction uh, at, the, at the base of the fishable ocean, um, simply because they never see it. But if you look at the aftermath, you you take something that is a a wonderful ecosystem, and afterwards it literally is a desert. Um, but because it's under the water, we can hide these things. So we must, who are people who are interested in cognition and information, we must put those things in front of people using things like 
virtual reality, augmented reality. So these must be a direct reality and people react to their direct reality, even the ones I was concerned with. You can't imagine how much I agree with that. In fact, I'm going to send you a link afterwards of a proposal that I made at this point being partly followed to put CCTV cameras 24-7 in all places where uh, animals are being um, used, whether for, to, re to rear them, to transport them, or to slaughter them. And, and, and not just keep it in the hands of the company so that they can uh, say that they're, they watch out for, for the, for the minimal uh, rules that there are, but to web, web uh, diffuse them and crowdsource inspection so that people are sensitized, so, so that their mirror neurons see what it is. This, anyway, I don't want to dwell on this because- No, 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 let's, let's dwell. I mean, let's dwell. So the, the article I've written is called Quintessential Solutions to Existential Problems. I will make sure that you get a copy of it. Um, one of the, um, one of the, things that I've mentioned there, I've actually called the Panopticon Principle. And interestingly enough, the Panopticon was a um, design uh, credited to Jeremy Bentham, among others, of um, creating the new so-called uh, humane prison. Uh, you still see Panopticon prisons. Um, uh, there, there are still remnants of those prisons. But the idea was that the guard could constantly see the individual and it turned out that they were extremely stressful and disturbing places. And in the end, they were abandoned. But you can see them. They have a central location. And then all the wings, because they were called wings, spread out in hubs to try to do exactly that. And so um, people found that they didn't like to be in there. That was number one. But they also found people didn't like to work there. That's number two. And so, um, again, uh, I've just gone back to Bentham um, because of uh, trying to smack Bentham a little bit on his utilitarianism, but, um, but uh, the idea of uh, constant surveillance is indeed a way of bringing direct perception into those areas. Yeah, that will change people's opinion where, where indirect references or prints or papers or journals or books just simply won't. Last little thing, and then I think we'll wrap it up. A long, long time ago, I was in Princeton. When I was still in Princeton, I had a... Uh, was invited somewhere where the vice president of NBC was there. Uh, and uh, and uh, I think it was my brother who asked him, why is it that you give us such bad programs? They're, they're so low quality. And he said, tell me, what do you think is our business? Uh, and, and my brother said, well, you're, you're supposed to be producing good programs for people. He said, not at all. We are selling your eyeballs to sponsors whatever it is to these days whatever will get you a click or so on so uh it's been around it's been around for a long time yeah let, let me uh let me just um uh, bounce one off of you because um uh the bbc which was um sort of created around the middle 1930s its original charter was was for education it wasn't for um sorry i've got to drink off that it uh, sorry, no control over the technology. Uh, so the BBC original charter was um, was uh, uh, for public education, and so when BBC Two started in the early 1960s, um, the idea was education. And so David Attenborough, who was um, in charge, a very young man at the time, he was in charge of of generating programming. He um, he asked some of his old um, his old uh, professors to give um, to give basically a set of lectures. And so I think the two of the best programs ever made for television, bar none, are um, Civilization by Kenneth Clark, or Kay Clark, and then followed on um, when Attenborough uh, uh, commissioned uh, Jacob Brunofsky for The Ascent of Man. I mean, they, they should be, they are the epitome of what's the best in television um, uh, for, the, for the person who is being educated. But as you say, uh, that's not its purpose and, and hasn't been probably in this country uh, almost since its inception. But certainly in England and possibly in Canada, it probably has a more public broadcast system. So. Yes, B BBC and CBC are not like NBC. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, with that, I want to thank you for a very, very informative, very stimulating, and in the end, surprisingly resonating talk.
Well, thank you very much indeed. And thank you for the invitation. I really appreciate it. Merci à tout le monde. Et puis avec ça, je lève cette session. Merci. 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 Au revoir tout le monde.